Okay, welcome, Julianne. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. I'm very excited oh, to be you're here. Welcome. Yeah. So, um, Anne invited me to uh, talk, and I, I had a some ideas on my mind, and I've been given the opportunity to talk about it. So, I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm also aware that even though I've had many years for 25 years, there's a lot of people who are very knowledgeable about many years. Um, particularly all the physiological stuff that goes on. So um, tonight, this is just my story and what I've been through, and I'm hoping that it can help you in some way. So I've done a, a couple of um, PowerPoints that Lynn is going to put up, and we'll get started with that now. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, so... I've called it um, my shadow many years because with my journey, I don't see many years as that's such a major uh, player in my life. It's more like, oh yeah, I've had many years for 25, but I've managed to get freed from the symptoms. And so many years, he's still there, but he's just, he's just like my shadow and he follows me around and reminding me um, that it's still there and, and reminds me of the journey that, I've had and and have survived because it's a it's a brutal disease, as many of you know. So on to the next slide. This is what I'm talking about in part one. I'm going to talk about balance awareness week because I have had my balance cells destroyed. I'm going to let you about know about my many years timeline and how it's evolved, and then something that's really. Uh, close to my heart is it's it's my life my illness please let me choose okay let's start with balance awareness week so the next slide okay balance awareness week and on we go radio welcome to balance awareness week and as Anne said it's in its 23rd uh, year which I was really surprised about that I don't even think I heard about it a couple of years ago but I'm so glad that there is a balance awareness week I've got an image there because um, being with our loss of hearing I know we rely on our visuals a lot so uh, I've got the inner ear there, so you can look at what the sense of balance is and it's in our inner ear. And so when I'm talking about some of those words on there, hopefully you'll be able to understand a little bit better. Okay, with many ears, as you know, our balance becomes compromised and it can happen, happen slowly or quickly. And uh, so, but the balance is located in the inner ear and um, it's it's got a labyrinthine structure and it's made up of a series of fluid filled canals and ducts within the labyrinth of five balance receptors that are ideally placed there to detect different types of movement there's three re receptors for head rotation another for horizontal acceleration I feel like i'm taking off and one for vertical acceleration so with gravity the balance system also works through constant communication between the inner ear the eyes uh, and your body your muscles and your joints and the brain so there's a lot going on there but the inner ear is the major part for it okay next slide please um julianne there's something rattling is it a something yes is it rattling now? Could it be my, yeah. is it like that? Okay, I'll, I'll, I won't move my arm. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to repeat that if you're recording it without the rattle or? No, it'll be okay if we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, all right. Okay, this is my unbalanced story. Uh, on the side, again, I've got a visual so you can see what a healthy inner ear looks like and what our lovely many ears disease ear <laughs> looks like. Um, and you can see that we have a lot more swelling. Um, so in my case, I chose to have my balance cells destroyed with gentamicin to stop the vertigo. Um, so it wasn't for me getting slowly used to my imbalance, so like it happened within the, in, within the day. So I had, on a Monday, I had my balance cells destroyed with gentamicin and Tuesday when I woke up and started walking around, I had very bouncy vision. So 
it yeah it like I was quite shocked and my husband rang my EMT to say hey this has happened he said oh that's really good news that means it's working so yeah I had to be really careful with all of that my EMT said don't climb any ladders don't jump over any fences and yeah although I, I do do that but I hold on really tight but I did try and climb over a little fence going oh it's only little I can do that and yeah and I fell over it um, but anyway, yeah, it's, so it was really hard. Well, it wasn't hard, but I was really conscious of using my eyesight more. So, and even now my eyesight's pivotal in my balance. I still use it all the time, even though it's been like 15 years since I had that done. So when, if you do have something like that done, the, the brain is quite amazing. It's, they call it brain plasticity, um, also known as neuroplasticity. And it comes into the equation when you have that done. So your brain plasticity refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of the experience of the experience. So I had all my balance cells destroyed on my left side. So my right side's working over time and with my eyesight and my brain's putting it together so I can get a new normal with my balance. I didn't back in 2004, I had never heard of um, vestibular rehabilitation. I didn't even know it existed. My EMT didn't know that it existed. I was like a, um, a, an experiment in progress. Um, even when my EMT did my gentamicin, he ran the many years guru in Sydney, so prof uh, Professor Gibson, um, to ask how to, to administer it. So. Yeah, I think I was probably the first person he had ever done. Um, yeah, so, but before I uh, had my cochlear implant, one of the things that they said I had to have, um, it was vestibular rehabilitation. I'm like, oh, okay, because I thought my balance was pretty good. After 15 years, I thought I was coping really well. But when I went to um, vestibular re re rehabilitation, they gave these new techniques and I was just gobsmacked by um, the improvement in my balance. Before I went, I could walk uh, heel to toe, two steps and over balance. By the end of my vestibular rehabilitation, I would walk heel to toe uh, for over 100 and then I'd stop because I didn't want to count anymore. So it was just such a vast improvement. And before my vestibular rehabilitation just doing this my head from side to side would make me nauseous with vestibular rehabilitation i didn't get that anymore so um yeah i just highly recommend it even if you haven't had your balance cells destroyed i highly recommend you having vestibular rehabilitation because it does help such a lot so I'm finding like probably I had the rehabilitation in November last year and I'm just noticing at the moment that it's not so good again. I don't know if it's changes in my good ear, but I will need to uh, redo those exercises, sort of top it up and remind my brain and my eyes and my ears, that you, you know, what we're doing and let's get our balance a little bit better. So yeah, quite amazing. Okay, next slide, please, Lynn. my many years timeline and on to the next one okay mine started in 1995 and it was like my left ear was blocked like i'd been swimming but i hadn't and i went to the gp who sent me to the ent um, i had blood tests a ct scan there were no medications so my ent was looking for nasty things like tumors etc there so nothing showed up. So um, he said, yeah, it possibly could be uh, many years or it could be multiple sclerosis. And he said, let's just play a waiting game and see what uh, symptoms come about. So we played that game for probably five years. In 1996, I had my first full on vertigo attack and it was about two hours. It was probably a short one for me uh, compared to the ones that would come later. So, and I was left shell shocked at the viciousness of it. Um, my ENT back, back then just pres prescribed a diuretic and, and stematil. 
Stematil didn't take the nausea away from me and I had to take two all the time and it still wasn't very good. So those um, nausea wafers that we've got now, they weren't available way back then or not for people like me anyway. In the year 2000, I officially was diagnosed with Meniere's disease. And again, I had just had a diuretic and stematol. Um, I researched a lot when we finally got a computer. So like we were in like 2001 or something or 2002, did we have a computer at home? I just, I was on there researching many years disease all the time. And I came across this uh, study in Japan and it was talking about an antiviral. So for um, the cold sore virus. So, or herpes, I think it's called that. So, and in this Japanese study, um, they had tried this antiviral and it stopped there many years. So uh, I went to the, my <laughs> ENT with just filled with so much hope. Um, and he like, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't heard that, but yeah, you can try it if you want, but he wouldn't prescribe the acyclovir. I had to go back to my own doctor and she prescribed it, but I had to pay like $375 per script because I didn't have herpes. It was just all so stupid and we couldn't afford it. My mum and dad ended up paying for it. Um, but yeah, we just remember thinking, this is it. I won't have many years disease anymore. And yeah, no, it didn't work. So over the next four years, I tried a lot of other things as we do when we have something that's incurable. So I tried acupuncture. Um, I did sound therapy with the tomatoes effect. I journaled uh, my, life my lifestyle style to see what was set off the vertigo attack. So like what I ate, what I drank, what I did. I was looking for a trigger or a pattern, still couldn't find something. I started my own research online. And when we finally um, had that computer, I said that before. And I also, yeah, just reading lots of uh, many years groups, looked at the temporal mandible rod joint, um, your TMJ, had that checked out, that was all good. I also trialed CERC, I think that was about 2003. So before many people knew about it. And again, it didn't work. In 2004, um, I went back to teaching uh, and I was, terrified that I would have a vertigo attack in that first week with a lot of pressure going back to teaching. So uh, my ENTP on prednisone, uh, <laughs> the very first day of school, I had this really slow spin in class. And I, but I kept going. It's just what I didn't want to happen. Um, and then I ended up having a really bad reaction to it. So I could not sleep and I lost three kilos and I could not stand still and my and my skin was I, was I had to get out of my body and it was just disgusting and I ended up going um, to my doctor and for sleeping tablets and I called my ENT and it was Look, let's quickly get you off that reduce the medication it was just a terrible time I'm trying to go back to teaching and having that at the same time the prednisone for me made um, perhaps just one day a difference. When I first took it, I was like, oh, I can hear. And like, it was like, I could turn my head whatever way. And it was like, it was, it was more, almost like a miracle drug for me. But then yeah, it went down very quickly. Um, that didn't work. So we, I had a grommet because my ENT said, let's try grommet. So I did that, had that done on a school night, went back to school the next day, much to all the other teachers, shock and horror. Um, and again, yeah, filled with hope. This is it, this is going to work. And no, it didn't. So, and in the mid year, um, yeah, I went to my ENT and I said, I just can't do this anymore. And he said, oh, look, we, we could um, do a gentamicin shot. Uh, to destroy balanced cells and stop the vertigo. And I was just like, oh, let's do it. I, I just can't do it anymore. And it worked after one shot. So I had a week before the two-week school holidays off and I was back at school, you know, after the holidays uh, with no problems. So in 2013, I actually resigned from teaching. Um, and it was partly due to my many years disease, my lack of balance, I had no um, direction of sound in the classroom. 
so when a child would speak with it, I'd be searching for where this child was, especially if they weren't in their own seat. And I've got this really funny memory of uh, having to take over a year two class uh, when my class was out here one day as a teacher, so I'm a teacher. And anyway, I went into this year two class and the phone was ringing. I had to answer the phone. Could I find the phone? No, I was searching everywhere. Like, so where is this phone? I ended up saying to the kids, where's the telephone? And they all went, over there. So I went and picked it up. And the phone rang two more times in that 30 minute time. And every time they went, the phone's over there. Like telling me it's time. It was, it was quite funny. But yeah, 2013, I ended up leaving teaching. Um, it was, and it broke my heart to do that because teaching was my passion. So, but, you know, I volunteered as a research subject at the University of Queensland's Mind and Brain Centre. So I did that twice. The first time in 2013, my, my, my sorry, my dad and my brother drove me. Um, and I didn't get any photos with that one, but they, they were just testing me. They called, put a call out for many years, people. And uh, they were just doing lots of tests and things like that. Um, and it, that was quite interesting that day because I had a lot of conversations with the researchers and they said that they had an elderly lady in there and she said, oh, I've got, I've had uh, many years for 20 years. But when they were doing the test, they discovered that she didn't have many years at all. She only had BPPV. So that's a, the misalignment of the crystals in the ear. And uh, they referred her to a physio to do the Epley maneuver and she was vertigo free in a couple of sessions. So I was like, oh, I wish that was me, but it wasn't. In uh, 2016, I volunteered again at the University of Queensland's Brain and Mind Centre. So every time I rang up to volunteer, I'd have to say, um, you know, I've had my balance cells destroyed. I don't know if I'll, I will be valid for your research. And uh, they would just be so excited on the phone. They're like, no, that's fantastic. You've got definite vestibular damage. We would love to have you with us. And yeah, um, my husband came with me that time and he took some photos. So you can see that in the top of the screen there. I've got a, a spew bag. Uh, I was testing virtual reality. So they were trying to uh, devise a program that would help desensitize you, you for balance so you wouldn't get so nauseous and off balance. Uh, before they did that, I had to do a whole stack of exercises and they were trying to get, you know, trying to work out how bad my balance actually was. And I hadn't had any vestibular re re rehabilitation at that stage. So it, it was really bad. Um, I, I was quite nauseous through it. And when I sat down, I had these virtual reality goggles on. Uh, they started the program and within 15 seconds, I was ready to chum that into my bag and she stopped it. And she said, do you want me to stop the research? And I said, no, no, I can do it. I've come here to help. I can do this. So we kept at it again and again and again, and I managed to get through it. And I discovered that the more I did it, the less nauseous I got. So I, for me, that was a clue that it was working. Um, and at the end, it, like it was, I, I was so off balance and I had to fill out this questionnaire and I just, I started crying and not for me, but because of what we have to go through with our many years, it's just so brutal. It's just horrendous. Um, yeah, it was yeah, just, a, yeah. Anyway, um, I was nauseous for like a week after and I was really off balance for three weeks after volunteering for that research. But yeah, it was well and truly worth doing that. So um, anyway, in December, uh, I <laughs> decided to get a cochlear implant because I discovered, oh, sorry, did I miss one? Oh yeah, 2016, besides doing that, I got my first hearing aids. Um, it was the cross type where the left goes over to the right hearing aid. It was then that I discovered that I had some hearing loss in my good ear, but it was high frequency. We don't know what that's from. So by 2019, like it sort of really hit me that, okay, I'm deaf in my many ears ear. I'm going to lose my hearing in my good ear. 
uh, I need to do something about it. So I'd had a friend who lives in Cairns keep saying, get a cochlear implant, do it now, don't wait. So I finally uh, got brave and I investigated it and I joined a cochlear implant experiences group on Facebook and just read everything and how everything was done. And yeah, I just, I went in and had it done, had the surgery, woke up, never had any pain, no dizziness. It, like I couldn't, it was like nothing had ever even been done. And I said to my surgeon the next morning, I said, did you put like slow release pain relievers in there or something? He said, no. Um, yeah, so I attribute that to his skill. So it was just t totally amazing. Uh, in January, um, my CI was switched on. Um, and they're the other photos that you can see there where I've got the yellow dress on. Uh, and my different faces of hearing for the first time and yeah, just really focusing on what I actually could hear. So yeah, it just blows me away. There's the cochlear implant. I should have had it done earlier. It's just, just amazing. So um, what I really love is listening to music and it's almost like a spiritual experience at times. It's very, very addictive. So yeah, I highly recommend it if you could get one done. Okay, the next slide, please, Lynn. Um, back in 2002, after a really bad vertigo attack, because mine used to last three or four hours, I couldn't close my eyes. I could only stare at the wall for the entire time. If I closed my eyes, it was like I was dropping in this black, bottomless pit had no end it was just terrifying so I had to keep my eyes focused on the wall the entire time it was so tiring I managed to be able to uh, learn I learned to half close one of my eyes and that seemed to help a little bit in some strange way but so tiring as you all know and the you know the vomiting uh, oh, it's just awful so um, one time after a particularly vicious, violent attack, I was in the shower and I thought, oh, I've got to find a cure. Nobody should, nobody should suffer like this. Um, so I vowed back then to do whatever I could to help find a cure. And I thought, oh, maybe, you know, it's probably medications and, and just leaving my inner ear to research in my will. Um, but then it became much more than that. Uh, I wasn't a writer at the time. Um, but in 2013, I released a picture book called Vanilla Swirl, and it's dedicated to all the children who have an ill parent, not just for many years, but everything. Um, so a parent who's incapacitated. Uh, and and um, the money from that goes to research as well. And then I, it was like, just the, the Vanilla Swirl's about a mum and a daughter. And I was like, oh yeah, men have this too. So. Uh, I did um, Blueberry Swirl about a uh, father and the son and Shez Kennington in New Zealand who's got bilateral medias, uh, she was so kind in doing all the illustrations and did an absolutely brilliant job. So at one stage we had a copy of these books going around the world and uh, people would sign it and write a message of hope in it but three times it got lost along the way um, and then I gave up doing that. But it was a really nice thing for people to get this book in the post and they'd get excited and they read other people's messages and yeah, it was really lovely at the time. Um, yeah, and then I, I, I wrote The Colour of Broken and that had been in my head for a little while. I, and don't think I just went from a picture book to a, a novel. I'd written quite a few picture books and I'd written six novels before The Colour of Broken. But this one I wanted to write for us many years people. And I wanted, to, I wanted to do many years awareness. I wanted to give people who couldn't explain what it felt like. I wanted to give them a voice. I wanted people who don't, don't have many years. I wanted them to understand what we go through. So I sat down to write The Colour of Broken I was going to write it the, with the main character with many heirs, but I, I just couldn't. It just it was too traumatic for me. I just I couldn't do it. And then it was going to be really boring because what do we do? We we spin, we go to the hospital, we, we go around the brain fog, we can't go anywhere, we can't socialise. Um, and I thought, no, nobody's going to read that. It's just going to be so boring. 
So what I did, I introduced another character who had a problem. And so we, we followed her story through and the grandmother had the Meniere's disease. But what I found when I was writing it, so when the grandmother would have a Meniere's attack, the Yolandi, who was the main character, she would find her grandmother, you know, and she'd be reaching out to her and she'd have compassion. She'd give her grandmother a hug when she wasn't spinning and things like that. I found it was like giving myself a hug and it, it was just really, really therapeutic. Um, and I cried for six months after, after writing the book. And because, yeah, it was just... It was, it was a, a book of heart and soul. I put, put everything into that to help everybody else. Um, it did hit number one on Amazon in its category um, at one stage and also the American version. I did two different spelling, I'll never do that again, uh, was number two. So like it's done really, really well. Um, yeah, just, it's just been an amazing book for us and I'm glad that I could write that. And I've donated just over four and a half thousand dollars um, to the Many Years Research Fund Inc, which, which is in Australia. So yeah, I'm very happy to do that. I've um, got the new book coming out next year. It's not quite finished, but I'm getting very close. And if you are someone who has read The Colour of Broken, uh, and I get asked this question all the time, what happens to your land in Zander? They want to know what, what happens next. Well, I've brought them into the new book so <laughs> you can see what's happening. And also Zander with his uh, many years research because he's a doctor in it. So yeah, I, when I'm writing the book, I do a lot of research and, and I've been discovering these interesting things about the many years research going on at the moment as well. So um, yeah, that'll be an interesting one to read. Okay, next slide, Lynn, please. Um, okay, this, this is the one that really, I get sad and uh, sometimes I get really angry. It's my life, it's my illness, please let me choose. So on to the next slide. Um, this is what, I'm in quite a few uh, many airs groups on Facebook and I see this all the time that people, they've been to their ENT and they come back and they say, oh, the doctor said, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. Uh, and that really, that, that just blows me away because I know that there is more that they can do. But my first question is always, always what, have you, what have you tried? What have you already done? Um, and I don't always ask that uh, because I just spend all day every day uh, conversing with people on the many sites. But, you know, it really hurts me inside each time I hear that someone pleading for help and saying they can't do it anymore. Or in some groups where they're putting a call out for prayer for someone who's suicidal. Um, I've been there. I was suicidal at one stage. I didn't want to be here anymore. So I know exactly how that feels. Um, and I, I really <laughs> wish I had a magic, magic wand like in my picture books to uh, heal every one of us. So, and then, you know, I get angry when I read that they're, they're being told, I'm sorry, there's nothing more that we can do. Um, there is more that can be done, but it also depends on your ENT and what you are willing to do. Next slide, please. Okay. First of all, have you got the correct diagnosis? What if you don't have many heirs? Well, you know, like that, that story I told you about that lady when I was a research search subject, she had BPVV, didn't have many heirs. Well, what if it's another ailment that when diagnosed correctly, it's easily fixed? So you don't want to go and get your balance cells destroyed or, you know, vestibular nerve section or a labyrinth, labyrinthectomy when you don't actually have many heirs disease. So you've got to make sure that you've got the correct diagnosis. Number two depends on your ENT. Do they understand and listen to what's happening to you? Not only physically, but psychologically, socially, and emotionally. And how is your mental health? Are they supportive of your requests and treatment options? And the third one, what are you willing to do? So I'm pretty sure every time I book an appointment with my ENT, saw my name on the list and went, oh no, what's she coming for this time? Um, but anyway, he, he was just brilliant and 
I would take in my list, my questions, what I'd researched, and we worked through uh, the least invasive to the more invasive. So, and I, I just, I was done. I couldn't do the violent vertigo attacks anymore. Mine would come in clusters. So I'd have like nine vertigo attacks and they were three or four hours each and I was just debil debilitated. Uh, so I'd get nine of those in, in two weeks and then I'd have a bit of a break for maybe two months and then it would go again. But you know, in that, that break time, you're, you're not still not normal. Like you've got the build up, you get the brain fog. I'd be turning my head like this and I'd be wishing for the vertigo attack to come so I could get it over and done with. Um, yeah, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I had three young children as well to look after. It was just horrendous. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, yeah, sometimes I feel sorry for my kids because, you know, we couldn't go to the shops by ourselves. We didn't do go the wiggles. There was nothing that I could do by myself with my kids because it was just too dangerous. Um, at that time, my ENT said that I had the worst MD um, that he had seen. So he, he was a little bit reluctant to do the gentamicin with me. Um, and he said, oh, you'll lose, probably lose some of your hearing. And I was like, well, I've lost most of my hearing anyway, so it doesn't matter. And I was weighing up the options. I lose my hearing, no more vertigo, or keep my hearing and still having vertigo attacks. Well, it, it was just a no-brainer for me. And I know that he talked about, you know, you, it, it destroys your balance cells, but like I had no concept at all of what that would mean in balance for me. So I just thought, yep, let's do it. I, I'm done with the vertigo, vertigo. I can't do it anymore. And yeah, and it worked. It was just just brilliant. Um, so when when you're given options by your ENT, you've got to work through the pros and cons of each treatment, and you've got to see what's right for you. Like for me, destroying my balance cells was a godsend. It was amazing. But maybe for somebody else, they they're not willing to do that, or they they might be willing to maybe wait for what else comes in the future, or maybe your vertigo didn't come as often as mine did. Maybe yours is manageable with, uh, with medication. So every single case of us with our many as disease, we need to um, look at it individually. And what is right for one person may not be right for you. So, mm. okay, next page, please. Okay, so, what I advocate is it's your life. Um, be proactive and take control. So this is your weapon research. Scour the in internet for everything about many as disease and treatment options. Present them to your ENT to discuss. Um, this is your plan, trial, approaches and treatments that people are having successes with. So I'm, I'm probably guessing that you're not just part of Dizzy's Down and Under, but other multiple ones as well. You've got to be careful though, because um, you make sure you research it, because there's a lot of snake oil salespeople out there trying to make money out of our suffering. Um, yeah, so make sure you put your research into that. And this, the mantra, your mantra is never ever give up. You reach out, join groups, and we've got this together. I know uh, I just love our many airs groups because everybody is so supportive and they're friendly and yeah, and they just totally get what we go through. Um, it's just amazing. The other one is keep a journal. So um, I brought out a journal last year. Um, I don't know if you can see, but it looks like this. Uh, and this is a September 14 page that's on there. I'm actually going to release that for free, uh, the entire book for free is a bit PDF in the school holidays when I have some more time. Uh, and you can download it and print out the pages that you want. So my many as journal goes for 366 days for when we've got the leap year. Um, and I've got a single day for everyone, including putting the weather in there, highlighting the symptoms, what you did, what you ate, everything, medications, 
uh, things that I could think um, would help you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to upload that to Files in Dizzy's Down Under and you can just download the whole lot and print it off to help you. The, on the top right hand corner of it, I've got three things I'm uh, thankful for today. I, in my darkest days, one of the things that helped me get through that was just finding things I was thankful for, even if it was like a bee that was um, buzzing around a lavender or a flower opening or something like that. Um, just those little three every day um, really helped me. And uh, now that they've researched mindfulness, <laughs> even though I was doing that a long time ago, they do find that it makes a big difference in the lives of people. Yeah, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the last slide for part one. So we've got questions coming up pretty soon. Um, then after the questions, I'll be talking about reasons for hope uh, and my tips for surviving the many years beast. Um, and there's some of my uh, artwork there for you. Yet there is hope, the colour of belief. Thanks, Lynn. So we're waiting for some questions to come through. Is that correct? Yes. Well, there's a, a few here. The okay. First one is, with a cochlear implant, can you tell me if you can work out where sound is coming from? Oh, yes. That's what I have about as well, especially in the classroom because I'm teaching uh, secondary two days a week at the moment. Yes, I know exactly where uh, mm. the sound is coming from. So in the past... Um, unilateral hearing like you can't work out where it's from. My husband's actually saved me three times for being run over by a car because I didn't know where the sound was coming from. Um, yeah, it's just amazing. So I've got total sound location now. It, it just blows my mind. It's just so amazing. Uh, and I was listening really, I was just focusing on listening and I can, birds actually sound like birds. And uh, classical music is really good because you can hear the stringed instruments. It's just uh, yeah, phenomenal. It's amazing. Yep. Next question. How can you reduce tinnitus? Oh, yeah. In one ear. The uh, $64 million question. I had five noises of tinnitus in my many ears ear louder than anything. I even went to two cellos, um, electrical, electric uh, cello concert. My tinnitus was louder. When I'd get invited to um, parties, loud music, loud voice, my tinnitus was loud. There was nothing that I could find that would be louder than my tinnitus. Um, I never found anything to help with that. I do believe there's some hearing aids that help mask it. Um, but my hearing was way too gone for that to help. Um, again, it, it's like getting in early. And so if you've still got hearing, you've got tinnitus, go and find an audiologist and see what they can do for you with hearing aids that mask tinnitus. But I do have to say that my cochlear implant totally stopped all the tinnitus in that ear. Um, the, and the first day, when I first had it on, like I was just you're overwhelmed with noises and it's like this conversations going on, having their own conversations in chipmunk language at first because your brain's got to get used to it. So I'd be talking, listening to that, and my, brain's, my ears and brain's doing some other conversation on this side. Um, and then I went, we were going to the Big Bash cricket <laughs> on the very first day I had my cochlear implant, my, my cochlear audiologist going, sure, it's going to be really loud. Well, yeah, here we're going. Um, and anyway, I went into our walk-in road to work out what I was going to wear to the cricket and I suddenly stopped and I thought, oh no, something bad has happened. And I, and I had to pinch myself because I actually thought I had died. I had no tinnitus. And I, and I was really scared and I, like I was pinching myself going, what, like silence, what is that? I haven't had that for over like tw tw probably 20 years. It was such a scary thing, but um, yeah, it's just so precious now. You know, I thought I'd never ever ha have um, um, peace with um, hearing ever again. So, um, yeah, and I, I'm just noticing, like, when you have a cochlear implant, it takes a while to get used to it. And some days I can be sitting there 
uh, especially if it's really quiet and I almost feel like I don't have anything wrong with my many ears ear like there's no or, or uh, there's no fullness in there and, it's, and I can hear it's it's almost like I'm back pre many years times it's it's quite mind-blowing it's just amazing can you go to slide two that's it yes <laughs> okay so I'm going to this is only quite a short one I'm going to look at reasons for hope uh, and then my tips for surviving the many years beast so next slide please Lynn reasons for hope in the next one okay this is I've got a uh, some more of my artwork there uh, when I was freed from vertigo and then had my hearing back. So there's the, the bird flying free again and it's got bass sounds uh, and treble sounds with um, music dropping the vertigo swirl there. Um, when I look back over my timeline of many years disease of uh, 25 years, what I have done is listed the treatments that were available for me back in 1995 as you can see it's really short then in 2004 when I was searching for answers and searching for a treatment uh, searching for something that would work in pink you can see it's a little bit more and now 2020 this it takes up two columns this is what I, I've uh, gleaned off the internet of all the different groups and even research all the different things that you can try. I've got a mixture of uh, natural products as well as medications from the doctors. I've got alternative therapies in there as well. Um, and yeah, just, just a whole stack of stuff there. So. And because, you know, sometimes we're not even aware that some of this stuff is about. So I've just listed it there. Uh, and if you're curious about what the medication is, then you just sort of Google it and see how it can help you. Um, I know that when people have a vertigo attack now, they sometimes they take something and puts them to sleep. I never, ever had that um, offered to me way back when I had my vertigo. Um, and if I had vertigo again, I, I would really like to do something like that instead of staring at the wall for three or four hours while the room is, or, while everything's spinning. Um, and, and also cochlear implants weren't available way back in 2004. I think I read some research that they only did it, started doing it for many years, people in 2015. And what they discovered is people with many years disease get the best results with uh, regaining hearing with a cochlear implant. And the reason being is like we've already had hearing and so when they switch on the cochlear implant, you've already, your, your memory cells or words, they're, they're already in there. So when your brain is looking for those files, it's quite easy for it to go, oh yeah, I remember that word. Oh, that's what it sounds like, stuff like that. Whereas someone who's like being deaf since uh, birth or three years old, it's a lot harder for them to learn the sounds and the words. Um, yeah, so I created that list for you just in case it does help you in some way, shape or form. I've got good things are coming because I have been doing a lot of research, especially for my, my latest book. Um, and I was going to list it all there, but I just thought, no, I'm running out of pages. So, and it's better for you to Google uh, many years research and see what's coming up. There's a couple of companies uh, in America that have got something coming up. There's a company in France that's looking at something to, for many years as well that I saw recently. Um, so like we're not being forgotten like just think and i know that uh, the many years research fund so our australian um that's been researching forever for us and who i donate all of my my money to uh, they, they're, they're pretty close as well and you know just critical in in their research and what what they've discovered and what they trial and and things like that they're just amazing um even recently they're talking about regrowing hearing cells um so i don't there was one company that have trialed they've done phase three trials and 
the guy presenting was really honest about it because uh, I thought oh, they're just going to say it's magnificent, you know, just to get money. But no, he was, he was really, really honest about it. And he said, yes, it did work, but it was only enough, like if you've lost your hearing, only enough to improve your word recognition, not, not back to normal hearing, not yet. So I really appreciated his honesty with that. And, and also there was like, there's always many air symposiums going on where all the researchers get in there and they share all of their uh, research and their data and what they've trialed. Um, there was supposed to be an international one this year, um, but it was canceled due to COVID. So um, yeah, that, that's, you know, reasons for hope for everyone there. Um, compared to what I had back in 1995 and 2004. And just be aware, like I've listed all those things, but it doesn't mean they're safe for you. You need to um, get your, in your doctor's uh, approval or, you know, and, you know, people are allergic to things and stuff like that. So even though I've listed it there, just be cautious if you ever... Uh, investigated or, or you know go to your doctor or whatever about that so uh, yeah okay next slide please okay these are my tips for surviving the many years beast we okay, go next page please okay survival mode and there's my artwork again <laughs> today's forecast uh, <laughs> survival mode it was seek medical help um, yeah, educate yourself so you're a many years ninja. Join support groups. I mean, when I had many years disease, there were no support groups. I think when I finally got a computer, I, well, when I finally went on a computer, it wasn't my own computer. I managed to get on to hop onto this forum with many years disease. Uh, so there's nothing like Facebook now. But I, I remember something that stuck in my mind. There was this lady called Cat, somebody. Um, and I really loved the way she supported and she was positive, things like that. And then one day her husband got on and said that she took her own life, she's suicidal. Like that, that just impacted me so much back then. Um, yeah, so support groups are so, so good now. It's yeah, important to be there. Sometimes some of them may have some other things going on in the group. If you're not comfortable with, you know, comments and stuff like that, just leave the group. We, I mean, we don't need disharmony or to be attacked or anything like that. This next part, uh, I think sometimes gets overlooked when people are talking about incurable diseases of any sort. Um, it's, you will experience grief um, and it's not necessarily in this order and not necessarily all of them. And you may be in any of these stages at this time. So you, you know, you're denying it at first. And then you get angry, uh, bargaining, like, oh, if I, if I, if you give, if you cure my many years, then I'll do this. Or uh, if I do this, this will, you know, the bargaining, depression. Uh, and then the final is acceptance. And again, not, not necessarily in that order. So I'm at, at the acceptance stage. I spent a long time in anger and I spent a very long time in a very deep and dark depression so, um, yeah, I uh, yeah, don't know I was bargaining. I used to pray a lot, but I don't think I was bargaining because I was, you know, this is what I've got. Um, you, you can also experience anxiety, and I had really bad anxiety because, you know, the unpredictability of many years disease, you don't know when you're going to have an attack. So my anxiety was so bad that I would, wouldn't leave the house without my husband or my mum and dad with me. Um, and yeah, we wouldn't drive without any of them with me. So uh, yeah, and the depression, it took me a long time to get help for depression as well. So um, yeah, but when I did, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it helped me move on. So educate yourself about seeking help. So it might be cognitive behaviour therapy, which I sort of learnt by myself with my own strategies. Um, and medical help, maybe you do, do need uh, some medication for anxiety or depression. It uh, doesn't mean that you're a weak person. It means you know, your chemicals are out of whack and you just need a little bit of help to 
uh, survive what you're going through. And, you know, when you're feeling better, you can come off those medications. So you don't, you don't need to suffer through any of those at all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is my super survival mode. Every day it would be finding three things I was thankful for, like every single day. From the moment I wake up, I'm like, oh, thank goodness I don't have vertigo. So, and then I just look for three things that I'm uh, thankful for. Um, also, doing something you can achieve, even if it's just getting out of bed in the morning. Um, if sometimes for me, it was actually making the bed. <laughs> uh, yeah, just something you can, you, you feel good about, you can achieve it. So, and do something that you love, no matter how insignificant others think it is, do something that you love, distract yourself. So for me, my distraction uh, was writing. Like I was never a writer, but I sort of fell into writing and I discovered that I could go into a different world and I wouldn't hear my tinnitus. Um, yeah, and it took, just took my, my mind off the suffering all the time because you're constantly aware of your head and, and I call head lag where you turn your head and then your head catches up or, or nausea. So distraction is really, really good. And don't put off any treatments like I did. So don't wait. Don't wait for medications. Don't wait to get those hearing aids, especially if you mask your tinnitus. Uh, don't put off uh, a cochlear implant if you like very if you've got very little voice discrimination, because the longer you put it off, the longer it takes to relearn hearing the words again. So, and, and the very last one is um, be kind to yourself. That that's just really really super important. That one. Um, yeah. Last slide, please. So yeah, so uh, hopefully I've given you some reasons for hope and a little bit more hope about what you're going through with the ugly many years disease that I hate with a passion. Um, and that's why I keep trying really hard to raise money to help find a cure and volunteer as a research subject. So yeah, so thank you for listening um, to my spiel. Do we have any more questions now? Yes, thank you very much, Julianne. Um, where or how can one access vestibular rehabilitation? Right, yes. So when I was going for my cochlear implant, I had to go to a psychologist. Like They just don't go, yes, you've got to be a candidate. They've got to check that you're suitable. Because some people won't cope with having the technology in their head. Um, or they may not keep up the... Uh, the exercises to relearn how to hear because you know it's a $25,000, $30,000 implant that they're putting in there and the government pays for it, you don't pay for it. Mm. Um, so they, they, they do see if you're a candidate. So for me to get my cochlear implant, I had to, you know, have an MRI. Uh, I had to see a psychologist. He had to give me the go, them the go ahead that I was suitable. Uh, I had to see a vestibular rehabilitation person and, and it was my cochlear audiologist who was leading me uh, in the lead up to the cochlear implant who uh, gave me the referral to the person. Yeah. So it wasn't a physiotherapist, it was a specialist, who, as someone who specialised in vestibular problems. Thank you. So, and I needed a referral for that, I think. I've been told by my yeah. ENT that gentamicin is my next step after sudden increase or cluster of attacks. What would you advise yes. about or know about or try before going ahead? So for me, before the gentamicin, it was the uh, grommet. Um, and now I had the full dose of genomycin, so I, and I'm pretty sure that my NT put some bicarbonate soda in sterile water before we put it in there and make it penetrate better. They, now, nowadays they've got a low dose gentamicin, uh, and that the reason they do that is to try and preserve as much hearing as they can. I believe that there's also a, a, a slow release steroid that they can inject into your ear as well. So when you have gentamicin, you, like you, you are damaging your balanced cells. 
So I would be trying other things that are less severe on your body first um, before you get to the gentamicin. Mm. Mm. Although it was a game, it was a life changer for me. Yeah. Then one more question then. One more question. Here, did you get the cochlear implant in? Uh, so 2000, December 2019, I had the operation and January this year, I had it switched on. Mm. Okay. All right. I think that's Thank it. You. Yes, I think it was which ear? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's a typical many ears thing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> my left ear. Do you want to, my question is, do you want to see it on my head? I can turn my head so you can see it. Shall I do that? Yes, please. Okay, so just let me know if you can see it. So, whoo, so I nearly fell off my seat. <laughs> okay, so um, there's the over the ear doodad, and in in this knot of hair is um, the magnet that goes onto the in, onto the device. So uh, I hope you can see that. Uh, so the, the magnet that joins onto the inner ear part drives all the mechanisms so that you can hear through the electrodes they put in there. Um, I believe that uh, uh, Cochlea is bringing out a new uh, attachment this year. It doesn't have the over the ear thing. It just clicks onto your head so you don't have all the other gadgets. So I'll just pull it off so you can see it. So can you see that? That's what it looks like. So what's coming out at the end of this year, and I'm on a list to trial it. It's, you, you just have like this, whoop, sorry, this part, sorry, this part that you don't have any over ear thing. And they've, oh, yeah, cool. it's just amazing. So um, it's, it's all keyed up to your phone and you, you, control, you control everything on your phone. So when I was doing um, this talk, when we were talking before we actually started, I found that I had the volume up too loud. So I've gone from a six down to like a, a two. So it feels more balanced for me. So yeah, amazing technology. It's just blows my mind. So there are a couple more questions, but I know that okay. we can answer them afterwards. Yeah. Then there are a lot of thank yous. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> thanks. Yes. There are a lot of thank yous. And I'd like to thank you too, Julianne. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful presentation. You really, you. really, you're an inspiration to us all. And, you know, your positive voice, I don't know, it's, we need it, you know, we just need yes. it. Yes, yeah, that's, that's why I keep hanging around the group so, <laughs> like, people can go, oh, no, there is life as well. So, so don't go anywhere, just please. A, yeah, just <laughs> such a devastating disease. I, I just hate it with a passion. Mm. So, anyway, yeah. look, keep up the great work. Good luck with um, the sequel to uh, The Colour of Broken. The Colour of Broken, yep. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and Lynn, thank you very much for um, sponsoring this uh, meeting. We really appreciate it. Thank yep. you very much. Yep, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Anne, as well. Thank and you. thank you for people who have joined in. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank